Hello everybody, welcome back to another video. In this video, we're gonna be covering the magnitude and the direction. Now, another thing that we can do is we can write our vectors in terms of a magnitude and direction, which is great because one of the things that we discussed in the very first video was that in essence, a vector is a quantity with a magnitude and a direction. So it's kind of nice to be able to express our vector as such. So what I can do is I can take my vector, which has an x component fx in the i direction and a y component fy in the j direction and I can write it as follows where it's going to be the magnitude of the vector multiplied by another vector. So the first part out front here this is going to be the magnitude of the vector and it's simply just going to be a scalar so that's nice for us. The second part is where things get interesting so this right here is the vector's direction. As we can see it's a vector and it's going to define the direction of the vector. Now this is going to be very important. This piece right here is actually called the unit vector, okay? And the unit vector, I'm going to let, say that a couple times just so it gets stuck in your head because this is something you guys are going to see in the next video, the video after that, and even a couple more after that. As you guys are going to see, this is going to play a very important role moving forward. This unit vector defines the direction of a vector. But we're going to put that on the back burner for now and we're going to talk about the magnitude of a vector. So that's that first part out front. Now keep in mind that if we know the components of a vector, we're essentially creating a right triangle. If I were to say that I'm going three units in the horizontal direction or the I direction and two units in the vertical direction, well the magnitude, which is going to be the hypotenuse of this triangle, can be very easily solved using simple trigonometry, where that magnitude or the actual diagonal vector is simply going to be its x component squared plus its y component squared and then square rooted. Now what's nice about this formula is it serves as an important reminder to you guys that magnitudes are not negative. We've always talked about how these magnitudes are never negative and it just goes to show if we look at this formula. You guys would have to be very creative to get a negative magnitude using this formula. First of all, we're squaring the components. So even if our components are negative, they're going to be squared to become positive. The second part is, is we have a square root. We can't square root a negative number, at least not in this class. So that's going to be the magnitude. As we can see, it's nice and easy. If I have my vector in Cartesian vector notation, so I have its x and y components, I can very simply find the magnitude of that vector. But what about that other piece, that unit vector? So again, that vector that we multiply the magnitude into, that defines the direction of our vector, and it is called the unit vector. Now this unit vector has a lot of very specific properties that are going to be very important moving forward. All right, very important. You guys are going to hear about this unit vector an absolute ton. So let's discuss, the, let's discuss it a little bit before we move into the, the crazier topics. First of all, how do we get this unit vector? Well, it's actually very simple. Unit vectors can be obtained by dividing each component of a vector by the magnitude of the vector. So remember, we said if we have the components, we're good to go. And with the components, we can find the magnitude. So we have everything we actually need. So in essence, the unit vector can be found by taking the x component, dividing by the magnitude, and then the y component, and also dividing that by the magnitude. Now note here that in the end, we have two components. We still have something in the i direction and something in the j direction. The unit vector, is going to be a vector. Another thing that I want to note here is that when we look at what we're dividing, we're basically taking, if we have a force vector, we're taking something with the units of newtons or pounds and we're dividing it by something of unit with units, newtons or pounds. So the units are actually going to cancel out. So one key piece of information for this unit vector is it's actually going to be unitless. Because again, if we have pounds on top, pounds on the bottom, they're going to cancel out. Now, some of you guys may be saying unit vector, unit list. That's why it's called a unit vector, right? Well, unfortunately, no. <laughs> it's a good way to remember that it's unit list, but the unit vector is actually called a unit vector because of one very specific property, which is the magnitude of a unit vector is always going to be equal to one. All right, so if I have a unit vector, no matter what it is, if I'm told it's a unit vector, its magnitude is going to be one. I don't have to do any sort of calculation. And this is going to make a lot of the formulas we use in the coming weeks a lot simpler because we can make that nice simplification. So let's do an example to show you guys how we obtain one of these unit vectors. So let's say I'm given a force vector and its components are negative two i, so it's going two units in the left direction, 
plus 8j, so 8 units in the vertical direction. If I want the magnitude, we said that's easy, we got a nice formula. So the magnitude is simply going to be negative 2 squared plus 8 squared added together and then square rooted. So the magnitude is going to be around 8.25. Now, since I have the components, negative 2 and 8, and now I have the magnitude, which is 8.25, I can find the unit vector by simply taking those components and dividing them by the magnitude. So if I'm looking at the horizontal components, or the i direction, I'm just going to take that negative 2 divided by the 8.25, and that's what gives me the negative 0 0.243. So that's for the horizontal direction. If I want the vertical direction, I'm going to take that 8j, so 8 in the y direction, divide that by 8.25, and that's what gives me the 0 0.970 in the j direction. So that's going to be my unit vector. Now, it's kind of hard to see what exactly this means. So let's write out our vector as, fol as follows, where we have the magnitude multiplied by the unit vector. So we can write this vector as 8.25, again, that's the magnitude, and we're multiplying that into this unit vector. Now, it still doesn't become really apparent what does this mean, so let's look at our actual example. If I were to show that unit vector on an xy grid, it's going to look something like this. Now, you trolls out there might say, Clayton, that's not exactly to scale. Well, I, I know it's not exactly to scale. It's just for purposes of illustration. So we have our unit vector here, and what we're doing with that unit vector is we're multiplying each component by a scalar. Now remember that when we multiply a vector by a scalar, we're simply extending or scaling that vector. All right. So if we take that unit vector there and we multiply it by 8.25, we're simply stretching it by a magnitude 8.25. And that's what gives us our actual force vector. So let's talk about the other two things. So remember in 2D vectors, we said, all right, we had our Cartesian vector form. And with that, we were able to do two things. The first one is the magnitude, and then the second one is the unit vector. Well, we said in 2D, the magnitude was very simple because if I have the two components, fx and fy, well, the magnitude there is simply going to be fx squared plus fy squared added together and then square rooted because we have a nice right triangle here. Everything works out very nicely. Well, how about in three dimensions? It actually follows the same logic. So if we have a 3D vector like this, what we can actually do is we can start creating a series of triangles. So the first triangle I'm going to look at is in that xy plane right there. If we have a triangle in the xy plane, it has a hypotenuse, which I'm going to call fxy, because again, it's in the xy plane. If we were to do some basic trig on this triangle, remember it's a right triangle, we can figure out that fxy squared is equal to fx squared plus fy squared. The hypotenuse squared is equal to the two side lengths squared and added together. So, so far, so good, nothing too crazy. But what else is nice is we can form a second triangle, this one going from the xy plane vertically. And again, this is also going to be a right triangle. And we can say that for this one, the magnitude of the force squared is going to be equal to fxy squared plus fz squared. Now, it looks pretty complex, but remember that fxy, we actually have a formula for it, it's above. So from there, I can substitute what I got for triangle 1 into triangle 2, and I can conclude the following, where the magnitude of f is equal to the square root of fx squared plus fy squared plus fz squared. So if we compare this to the 2D case, all we did was add that extra component at the end, that fz squared. And this is where 3D actually isn't too bad, because all we're going to be doing for every scenario is just adding that extra component. And a little fun fact for you guys, you don't need to know it for this course, but if I were to extend this to four dimensions, five dimensions, all I would be doing to this formula is just tacking on that additional uh, component squared. You guys will learn more about this in linear algebra, which I guarantee most of you will not like. So we talked about magnitude. We said, ah, oh, easy peasy. All we have to do is add that extra component. What about the unit vectors? Clayton, surely the unit vectors must have something a little different. Well, before we talk about the formula, Let's just remind ourselves what a unit vector is. Remember, in essence, a vector is a magnitude, which we discussed in the previous slide, multiplied by a direction. And in two dimensions, we said that that direction can be expressed as a vector, which we call the unit vector. So if this was my force vector in 3D, the unit vector is going to look something like this. It has a magnitude of one, so it's going to be smaller than the force vector. And it has the same direction as that force vector. So there's the key, it has the same direction 
And again, we use this to define the direction of that force vector. Now, the unit vector is actually really nice because all we have to do to the formula compared to 2D is we're just going to add in that additional component. So remember in two dimensions, we said that we can find this unit vector by simply dividing each one of the components by the magnitude of the force. And that same definition applies here, where all I did was I took fx and divided it by the magnitude. I took fy divided by the magnitude. And now for three dimensions, I took fz and also divided by the magnitude. So again, same formula as 2D, we just have to add that additional component. Now, unit vectors in 3D, they maintain all of those same properties in 2D that we had. So if you guys are thinking about unit vectors, make sure you remember these three things. The first one is they're just used to define direction. That's it. They don't have units, nothing like that. They solely define a direction, which goes into the second point, they're unitless. Now, the last one, which is very important, and we've talked about this already, is that they actually have a magnitude of one. And you guys are saying, Clayton, you keep saying that, and you say it's important, but we've never had to use that idea. Well, in this lecture later on, as we're going to see, this is going to become very important, not only now, but also in later topics. So always remember unit vectors, they have a magnitude of one. So yeah, that's it for this video. I wanna thank you guys so much for listening. I really appreciate it. I hope you guys have a wonderful day and I will see you in the next video.